All right. So the breakout questions for today. Uh, what was the thesis along with the contemporary analysis for the reading? Uh, what does the thesis say about the possibilities for relate for race relations within the United States? Thinking in particular about uh, Black and Indigenous relations or African and Indigenous relations. And then finally, uh, what stood out to you most about the reading? Uh, who would like to share? I'll share my view is uh, actually the uh, integrations of the Africans to Mexico and the mixing of the culture, you know, because that seemed like what it was. It wasn't, uh, it was accepted on both sides of them to one came, the African came and they didn't bring violence or weapon or come to destroy or fight, uh, they basically came to trade and communicate. And then the Mexico people there, they accepted that. And so that became a structure or the foundation. And just like any difference, the first thing you wanna see with two animals, two top of the line animals come together, is peace, can y'all get along? And they did get along and they did exchange and accept the African ways. Perfect. Uh, so to kind of summarize what Donald said, I should say the confluence of African and indigenous culture here within on the American soil, right? Uh, who could provide us with a contemporary analysis? How does this information uh, fit with what's going on in our world today? In our group, we talked about the conversations around kind of like the difference or the debate with cultural appreciation versus cultural appropriation and how um, everyone from like different sides like have their own opinion on it, but some seem to be talking or showing their opinion without the education behind it that they need to be like having a certain stance. So I think with this, it kind of, I mean, at least helped me understand a culture with appreciation versus appropriating it. So that's what um, our group talked about. Perfect. Can you um, provide us, Kate, like an example of how you all define appreciation juxtaposed to appropriation? At least for me, I would say appreciation, it needs the education behind it and it needs kind of like a firsthand experience from someone of that culture explaining and sharing and being willing to share it versus appropriation. I mean, I think on social media, there's a lot of examples of it too, of maybe someone wearing like um, maybe a certain like sacred clothing to a certain um, culture and using it maybe just as like a fashion statement or um, because they think it's cool without knowing the uh, certain, like the name of it or why it's worn. So I think on social media, it's a lot of appropriation versus appreciation. So for you, Kate, you're tying the um, component of education to the appreciation, along with someone from that particular culture kind of giving you that insight, right? It's not stemming from an outside source, it's coming from someone within that culture. Um, that's a very good mm -hmm. thought. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Well, actually, let's move to question two. So we have the thesis, right? The ability for, of African and indigenous people to come together on the United on American soil and create a harmonious culture, right? Um, Kate points us to the difference between appreciating a culture and appropriating a culture. And, and what I gleaned from her comments is uh, what happens within the text is more of a appreciation than appropriation. So thinking about question two, how, what does this mean for the possibilities of indigenous and African relations on United States soil. In a negative or a positive light? It's up to you. Um, 
in my opinion, um, what, what I got from it was like, I would say like understanding each culture, you know, and like exchanging and like, um, like you know, like having a more deeper understanding, you know, to each other's cultures instead of just like, you know, being um, unaware about it. And I'll say from a negative standpoint, um, stereotyping, you know, um, just like you know, um, being separate, you know, separate but equal, and like I'll just say like you know. Um, you not letting stereotypes like put certain cultures in like a certain light, if I'm making sense. Anyone else? What does the reading or the thesis of the reading say again about the possibilities, right? Not what's going on, but what's possible about race relations in the United States? <laughs> So let's frame it this way. Let me let me help you think about the question in terms of a question. How are current re uh, race relations between the indigenous community of LA and the black community of LA? How are they? Hmm. They get along? It's harmonious? So I, I think it's the word, I like to use the word expansion of the cultural expansion of the getting along and you know cultural wise and expansion of mankind growing and accepting each other so i mean this is fast forward to america this is what's happening here now is we are expanding we have expanding and we have increased diversity and in people all over the world so it is a continuation from back then to still present. I, I got to push back against that, Don. Um, are, are you from the Los Angeles area? I live in Los Angeles County, yeah. Okay, uh, what part of LA, LA County? Uh, right now I'm in Whittier. Okay, I know about Whittier. Um, so I, I'm thinking about um, the early 2000s, maybe 2004, between 2004 and 2006, let's say, right? Um, I was doing a lot of organizing in South Los Angeles, uh, particularly the Lamar Lamert Park area. And a lot of the conversations that were happening in that community were um, the indigenous people are coming in to take our houses and to push us off of our territory. They're coming in to take our jobs and to push us off, that, off of our territory. That's what I recollect happening in the kind of discourse that was going on within the black community in the early 2000s. Um, I lived in Inglewood from, for about two years, about 10 years, excuse me, eight to 10 years. Um, I have to say that Inglewood looks vastly different now than it did when I lived there. Hmm. I would say the indigenous population in Inglewood has really, um, expanded and kind of took in that area over. I would have to say that some of the contentions that were being made in the early 2000s, if we were to look at Inglewood, are true, right? Yeah. So now this is what I know that the conversations were having in the black community. I'm not saying they're wrong or they're right. I'm just saying this is what I know to be happening in, in the black community in the early 2000s. And what I see happening in spaces like Inglewood. Now, I can't speak to what kind of intimate conversations happen within the indigenous community, but I've been teaching this class and I've been teaching that uh, Cal State LA for some time. In fact, I lived in East Los Angeles. I lived off of Breed and 4th Street while I was doing my undergrad. And I know how they treated me while I was living there. Um, I was <laughs> impressed all the time, right? Yeah. So I do know, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I lived in the IE for some time now. I know that this relationship and this that dynamic between African descended people and the indigenous people of this land can be contentious. I currently live on the border of Pomona and Claremont. About seven years ago, I remember when there was a green light on black folks living in Pomona. If you had a white t-shirt on and you were in a certain area, that meant that you could get shot. So again, I know at an intimate level, 
street level, right? How these relationships can become contentious. I know a lot of um, people within the indigenous community have been manipulated into believing the rhetorics of the likes of the Donald Trump. And because of that manipulation, they have been forced to view African and black people in a certain way, right? So when I ask you, what does this say about the possibilities for race relations within the United States? These are the things that I'm thinking about. Okay. What did this text show you that could be possible as it pertains to indigenous and African people? It shows you that they could come together and produce a beautiful, harmonious culture. So again, I ask you the question, what does the text say about the possibilities of race relations within this country? Thinking particularly of African and indigenous people. Hmm. So, the uh, when you say indigenous people, you or poor people, is that well, what you? No, uh, not necessarily. So, indigenous means someone is who is the original inhabitant of a land, right? Right. So, when I say indigenous people, I'm thinking of the people who you may call Hispanic, who we may call Mexican, right? These are the people who originally inhabited this land that we call the United States. The United States, right? These the original okay. people of this area, specifically when you're talking about California and spaces like New Mexico and Texas and things of that nature, right? The people who we identify as Mexicans were the original people who possess this land, right? Who are the descendants of the group that we read about within the text, right? So this is what I mean when I say indigenous, for a lack of a less accurate term, who you may call Hispanic, right? So again, hopefully this allows you all to understand the question better. What does the reading say about the possibilities of the ways that Black people and so-called Hispanic people could get along? Hmm. Gracia. OK, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, yeah, the reading talks about like how they uh, did trades together. And so maybe it could relate to how they uh, nowadays, they can do business with each other to help raise uh, like economic status or something like that. Okay. Anyone else? What does it say about the possibilities of how Indigenous and African people could get along? I would say um, that we have the potential to evolve with both our cultures, like we could have used two cultures to make one culture if we would have continued to have the unity and the understanding with each other. And, and, and we didn't let, you know, and if we didn't let the colonizers try to divide us or try to let the, um, the mindset of you know the colonizing of you know United States to like you know break split our mindset and to like separate us from each other. So when I'm hearing August, it it, it, talk, it speaks to the potential of us being able to get along. Yes. Right. It speaks to the potential of us being able to come together and produce a newness, come together and produce a culture. Now I'm gonna be real. I'm not. I don't think in that production of a newness, I'm not trying to give up my blackness. I'm not trying to give up my Africanity, right? Nor would I expect anyone from the indigenous community to give up their cultural specificity or essence, or essence, right? But I think what it does show you is that these two people who are seemingly different can come together in a space that's not contentious, right? Thinking back to the, re the first reading, eliminating strife, right? This book is an example of how two opposing quote unquote, communities can come together and produce a culture that is strifeless, produce a society that does not have strife. Uh, what stood out to you most about the reading? Go ahead. The thing that stood out to me. Okay, I'm sorry, Anthony, go ahead. 
Okay. No, I was just going to say how, like, they all got along together, you know? Like, I never knew about this. And I, when, I, when I was reading, I was like, like, I, I didn't know. I was like, oh, man, like, this is all new to me. And it, I just I just compared, like, you know, their interactions with, like, the Europeans' interactions with, like, pretty much any other country in the world. And, like, oh, they, like, they met each other. Uh, like, the Africans and the indigenous people, they were, they, put, they met and they were, like, they started trading and they exchanged co uh, the Africans actually influenced like the culture and the language of the indigenous people. And then like there was like no like no like mass genocide or like mass slavery enslavement, right? Like if you would, I mean, like the indigenous people saw like the Africans come to their land and they didn't they didn't like, oh, you're less than us because you're darker or you're less than us because you don't got a home or anything like that. But if the Europeans, I mean, we we saw, right? The Europeans pulled up to the indi indigenous land and they pulled up to Africa and look look at what they did. They pretty much eliminated everything but the africans went into the like the indigenous people land and they exchanged cultures and they became like pretty much like friends right they became friends and that's something that stood out to me that's a really good point anthony and i think what i hear also in your um statements is you're merging the the previous readings that we've done right the destruction of black civilization uh these myths and stereotypes and seeing how when europe travels when this notion of manifest destiny is proliferated throughout the, the world, right? The consequences are genocide. The consequences are the elimination of a, a beautiful culture, right? Juxtaposed to when, um, and it goes both ways, even when folks travel to Europe, right? It's not as if the Europeans are accepting them with open arms, right? Although we haven't read about that yet, um, this still remains true, right? And, and to Anthony's point, that's vastly different from the way that the indigenous people receive the Africans or the way that the Africans stepped foot on indigenous soil is not to conquer or not to plunder, um, but just to trade and exchange, right? So I think that's a very good point. Uh, Jasmine, were you gonna say something? Um, I was gonna say how like, um, to piggyback on what he said, like I feel like um, Europeans, they were more like ignorant when they went into like, um, like Africa and they, they weren't open to learning about um, different cultures. Like in this reading, it uh, mentions how like the indigenous people, um, like, where was it? Where they adopted like the windowless um, homes from the Africans. So I feel like they were more open to learning about uh, their culture and, the way they lived and they kind of like fused it into how they were living and just like being open. So yeah. Thank you. And very similar to um, Anthony, right? Just in the sense of their willing, a willingness to listen, a willingness to learn, uh, and not be militaristic in their exchanges with them. Perfect. Uh, anyone else want to state as to what stood out to them? Gracia, go ahead. Um, yes, I'll go. Um, well, it's kind of like off topic, I guess, but like, um, it was something about the Chichimex, how they view them. They like it reminded me how like the Europeans viewed individuals from like the African continent. Um, you know, they like I, I'm gonna read something really quick. They um, let me see here. Okay, their conditions are as as barbaric as wretched. They were they wore loincloths, palm fiber in that time. Their women stood in all of their simple, simple loom. So it just kind of like reminded me how, you know, you know like racist ideologies of like Europeans. So, yeah. No, I, I hear you, Gracia. Uh, and I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I don't think it's as malicious as it was with the Europeans, right? I think it's more just yeah. comparison, right? Like mm -hmm. African cats came in, they had, you know, uh, these decorations on their shit. They had these bees that rattle when they walk, right? Like, they shit was just, you know, a little bit more fly. Like, just call it what it is, right? Um, just opposed to the, the basic loincloths of those who occupied there. And it's not to say that these people are savages or primitive like the Europeans. Mm -hmm. It just said, like, for something, for some reason, right, with these African folks, there's something about the way that they choose to style and adorn themselves that's different, Right. And, and, I, and, and not to say it's a slight to the indigenous or it's a racist interpretation of how the indigenous people choose to adorn themselves. It's just that it's a different. And this is one of the things that caused the indigenous people to be more attentive to the Africans, right? And another thing that it mentions is a lot of the stuff that the Africans wore 
the indigenous people were familiar with them because their royalty wore similar type of adornments, right? So again, it's not to, to, to downplay or belittle, but just to talk about the, the difference in the way that the African folks presented themselves. But then even within that difference, they came willing to exchange some of those things with them, right? Does that make sense? Like the, the distinction I'm trying to draw, Gracia? Yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. Because um, you're not wrong. I, I definitely can see how you feel that way. Um, anyone else want to speak to what stood out to them before I get into the, my notes? All right. Um, I'm trying to fight this little cold, man, so bear with me. I'm not going to be too, too long because my throat is killing me. Um, so to my point, right, I'm looking at the top of, uh, well, towards the middle of page 93, the second page of the, of the reading. Actually, excuse me. Um, the book is titled They Come Before Columbus. Um, the ancient African presence in ancient America in the ancient Americas. Uh, the author of the book is uh, Ivan Van Sertima. Um, this book is foundational in the sense that it supports the claim that I tried to make um, in the beginning of the semester and throughout the semester. African people did not disseminate; they did not disperse solely as a byproduct of enslavement. Right? Um, I made the claim that at least two hundred years. Uh, prior to Christopher Columbus arriving to the Americas, uh, Abu Bukhar II, the brother of Mansa Musa, made his voyage to the Americas, right? This is all supported within this text. And what we read here is a chapter that um, authorizes or, or, or uh, adds credence to the notion that African people from Mali, the Mandingos, were able to travel to uh, what we now know as Mexico and produce beautiful culture with these um, indigenous Mexican peoples. Um, all right, so looking on page 93, um, towards the bottom of the first paragraph, it says, these black merchants, one second, these black merchants from the hot land sold vivid color mantles, excuse me, of cotton cloth, the cloaks so richly dyed, they seem to copy the iridescent plumage of the birds so various in design that the radial wheel of, of the sun, feathers and style shells, um, the skin of tigers, the forms of rabbits, rabbits, snakes, fishes, and butterflies mingled in the myriad of motifs, which um, triangles, polygons, crosses, squares, and crescents. So again, these are just speaking to how they chose um, to adorn themselves, right? The, the, their attention to style, their attention to detail. And I would argue it, it's no different from how Black folks are attentive to their style nowadays, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Don know what I'm talking about, right? Go go, go down in, go down in Lamar Park and see how, you know what I'm saying, motherfuckers on the block choose the style. <laughs> it's it's hey, like, you, know about, you know about bell bottoms? <laughs> yeah, I know about bell bottoms. They, they're making a comeback. My yeah. daughter. Yeah. 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 That's before me, but I, but my parents was in it, so I know about it. You know. What I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. This the next paragraph, and I think this is this is very important because it talks about how the African folks tried to like um situate themselves within this territory. They came at first in twos, and then in a small band. Their um, coming attracted attention, but this was less because of their extraordinariness of their appearance. Warners. All, after all, were expected to look different than the extraordinariness, extraordinariness of their wares. Some of the luxuries they offered in the common marketplace had been enjoyed almost exclusively by the noblemen and kings of Mexico, who seemed to have had some earlier contact with them. In the region of the um, Quatro Pastanic, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, excuse me, um, they had a, suddenly appeared, the spearhead of a larger migration group out of what the out of what world they had originally come from, no one knew, but they trickled in from the direction of the south and southeast. It seemed as if everyone were on the move at the same time. All sorts of people were gravitating towards the lakes from the nucleus of New Mexico. So, kind of like how uh, Chancellor Williams talks about how everyone wanted to gravitate towards Kimmy, right? Van Sertima is kind of making the same claim about claim about Mexico, right? And, and, and he says that, you know, at first the Mandingo, they came in two, <laughs> then they came in smaller groups and, and slowly kind of ingratiated themselves into their into these communities, right? And it says they weren't really tripping about their appearance, right? They're foreigners, they're expected to look different. But what caught their attention 
was their wares, what they brought with them, right? What they were able to trade. And as I mentioned earlier, right, they recognized a lot of these goods were being used by the noblemen and kings of Mexico, right? So this lets you know that these individuals had already had contact at some capacity with the kings of Mexico, or else how else would these kings have these goods, right? Um, talking about how they begin to, to, to spread their culture. Um, I'm looking at the bottom of page 94. Um, it says, the, but the Blacks had built a temple in the town as soon as they had formed a sizable capuli. Now, a capuli, C-A-P-U-L-L-I, is just like a small community, right? So when their community got to a substantial size, then they would begin to build their temples, right? In the forecourt of this temple, they set up the wooden statue of a werewolf who was there in Nagual. This statue, the statue fascinated him. So this is when you start to begin to see, um, we'll call like the spiritual confluence of these two communities, right? So for the um, Africans, their Nagual was the werewolf. Their, their um, I don't want to say God, but the symbol that they kind of looked to as a spiritual symbol was the werewolf, right? Mm. Okay, looking on the next page, on page 95, the uh, second, sorry, the first full paragraph. He was not the only one of the feather workers who was fascinated by these strangers. The attraction of men from the hot lands who provided them with exquisite new material for their trade was overwhelming. It was not long before they, before they were drawn also to their Nagual and began to join in their rituals and festivities. Even though he himself never worshiped the coyote Nagual, these were, the, these were the men with whom he eventually did most of his business. And they had become good friends, his good friends. He had been allowed to stand on the edge of the uh, palisade as the masked men chanted and danced on the day of the festival. Now, what I didn't read to you is that for the Africans, their Nagual was the werewolf, right? But for the indigenous, their Nagual was the coyote. And what it says in the text is, there was no werewolves, right? There was no werewolves in the United States. So the closest thing to the werewolf for this area would be the coyote. So what you see is the indigenous people, there already is this confluence of culture. They're doing what the next best thing is. Like, all right, bet we ain't got no uh, werewolves here, but I see that there's coyotes. So we gonna make this our Nagual because we don't have the werewolf because we're not in Africa, right? So you start to see these cultural confluences take place. Um, that. This is important. I'm looking on the middle of page 96. Um, it, it is with Mexico, however, that we are most concerned for here we can see the confluence of cultures, not just the confluence of bloods. When we compare the coat of the werewolf, the coyote of the prairies, found amongst the Amenteca with the coat of the werewolf, the hyena of the savannas found among the Bambara of medieval Mali, we see quite clearly there at the heart, sorry, at the very head of the confluence. Okay, so let's break that down because this is very important. So think about, um, think about the destruction of black civilization, right? And it talks about how um, the Asian merchants would come into Kemet and they will begin to marry into the royalty of the African family. So that way they would have access to the goods, the lands, et cetera, right? It says, so what you see within that and the purpose for that, right, is to have the blood mix. So that way I'm included into the family. So that way I have rights to the goods, right? Y'all with me on that. So check out what Van Sertiman says. It is here, it is with Mexico, however, that we are most concerned. For here, we see the confluence of cultures, not just the confluence of blood. So what does he mean when he says the confluence of blood? What does that mean? I think it's referring to like what the um, people did in Africa, right? With the marrying to the family, right? That's what it's. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But he's saying like, yo, that's not that big of a deal, right? That, that really don't mean shit. Because... As we know from reading the, the destruction of Black civilization, they can marry in, 
They can have your babies, but that don't mean that they respect your culture. In fact, that could be used as a mechanism to destroy your culture. So to be real and, and like to take an abstract way of kind of point, making the point, right? This is the same as true with mixed relationships. Oh, I love my white boyfriend until I find out he's racist. So we can mix blood and have babies, but that does not mean that you respect my culture. So what Van Sertima is saying, why Mexico becomes important, because in Mexico, you can see where these two cultures come together. And this is demonstrated with the werewolf and the coyote religion, right? So it says, we, when we compare the cult or the religion of the werewolf, the, the coyote of the Paris, found amongst the Monteca, Amanteca, which is the indigenous people of, of the United States, right? So when you compare their religion of the werewolf with the religion of the hyenas, sorry, with the, uh, excuse me, with the religion of the werewolf, the hyena of the savannah found among the Babara of Mali, you see the head of this confluence, right? So again, as I pointed out, their ability to try to do the most similar things based off of what they have shows that these two cultures, they merge together, right? Um, they go into talking about the uh, festivals that were um, conducted on the same day. Um, he even breaks down some of the languages that are um, very similar, almost identical between the two, um, between the two, 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 the two communities, excuse me. Um, but I, I do want to leave time for fishbowl. So I'll put my uh, lecture and my notes on pause and we'll open it up for fishbowl again twice per semester. Uh, you have one time to pass. You could talk about my notes. You could talk about your breakout discussion. Uh, you could read from your journal, all that's on the table. I'll take three people. Um, I ask for volunteers. If there's no volunteers, um, I'll call that random. Is there anyone who would like to volunteer for fishbowl? No. Okay, we have Kate and August. Let me get one more. All right, Andrew. So we'll go in that order. Uh, Kate, Kate, Andrew, sorry, Kate, August, then Andrew, excuse me. Uh, Kate, go ahead and stare us off. So I want to talk about Manifest Destiny, like you mentioned, because I feel like that was a really big part of my education growing up. Like history classes love Manifest Destiny. We talked about it a lot. And, but seeing it from this point of view with, more like information behind it it makes me realize how it was supposed to be seen as like this beautiful thing like the painting like we all know it but in actuality it was like a real stopper for what white america could have been like we could have had this confluence or this conversion of all these um cultures like we see in this text but but we literally like inhibited that ourselves by saying like, no, this is our right. This is ours and only ours. And it was very individual instead of saying like, let's go explore, let's go talk, let's go, I mean, mingle, honestly. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about because it related to something that I've l learned my whole life, but seeing it from this new perspective, it really becomes tainted. Good call out, thank you. Uh, August? Um, yeah, I took um, world history while I, I was while I was in high school, and mostly, you know, we always talk about, you know, like the U.S., the U.S. this, the U.S. that, but you know, like um, taking um, this Pan African class and like learning about, you know, that you know the relationship and history behind the African people and the indigenous people. It's like a real game changer because um, understanding like like you know what is going on today and how, you know, like, yes, we are more diverse, but, you know, there are still, you know, race and cultural uh, relationship issues that are still going on here today. And certain mindsets that we have inhabited, that we have, that we let influence us, you know, as we grew older, and, you know, in our you know, generations past to come. But yeah, you know, like, it's good to know this history and like, you know, understanding all, you know, all trade, all relationships, you know, what we exchange with each other. And, you know, it's, it's, it gives you the mindset of like, you know, 
if we were to maintain, if you know, this relationship was to be like maintained, you know, who knows what what the what if could have been. But other than that, you know, that's all I have. Thank you, Augie. Um, and Andrew. I'm just gonna be talking about uh, what I wrote in my journal, uh, the reading, which was uh, how the traders were gaining attention from the Mexicans because the luxuries they offered in the common marketplace were enjoyed by the locals and the kings of Mexico. Uh, also, the foreigners stuck out as they, or the Mendigo traders stuck out as they had worn different clothes made from different animals and also even had jewelry. Uh, they were also darker, so they stuck out and were believed to be from the south or far southeast. Uh, and there was a coyote and werewolf statue, which was built in the front of the temple inside the town. And this represented uh, a mixture of both gods that they both believed. Uh, also, it said there was a, a few native women who started dancing with the Mandingo traders, which led to the fusion of both the gods and the rituals. And it also stated that in a serological survey of the Lankadon Indians, the most secluded of the Maya tribes conducted the, uh, some uh, Negroid characteristics were found in their blood, which uh, may have been evidence of the mixing within the two tribes. And I found that pretty interesting as well, how there was evidence for that. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so before we, uh, what I, before we close, I want to kind of do two things. Give me one second. Pull something up. Uh, Andrew mentioned something that um, I definitely want to point out before we go. But before I do that, I want you all a question. When you hear the term race, when you hear the term race, not thinking about someone's identity, how else is this term race used? When not thinking about someone's identity. Not thinking about someone's identity, where else? you hear this term race. Um, sadly, um, I can't really think of much of anything, but if I were to take an educated guess, I would say um, cultural background. No, no. So don't think about someone's identity. Throw it out the window. How else as an uh, English language do you use the word race when not talking about someone's identity or not trying to describe someone? I know you know, Jay, so just hold on, let's let, let them, uh, go ahead, Taylor. Like competition races? Thank you, Taylor. That's where you hear the word race, competition, foot race, car race, right? Track is a race, right? So now let's, let's, let's take this logic a little bit further. Why would they use the term race, which means competition, to signify our cultural identities within this country? What's the significance of that shift? That like our cultural identities are like a competition between each other. Perfect. And this is why you do not see the cultural confluence that was present within the text. Because within this capitalistic Western individualized society, capitalism is dependent on competition. The only way that this system will work is if you have groups competing, each other, competing against each other for resources, hence the term race. So you're tricked into this misnomer or this false notion that Black folks need to compete against indigenous folks for resources. Asian descendant folks need to compete against indigenous folks for resources. Pacific Islanders are in competition with uh, Filipino folks for resources. This isn't true. There's enough to go around. 
We have enough homes to end homelessness. We have enough homes to end homelessness. Restaurants throw away so much food that no one would have to be hungry. And if anyone works in the, in, in the restaurant industry, you know what, what I'm saying, right? So I just point out to you two separate phenomenon that plagues our society, housing insecurity and food insecurities, right? And I'm telling you that we have the resources to eliminate both of those. But we choose, and I play great emphasis on choose, the country, the powers that be, the government, choose not to address those two issues. Tell me I'm wrong. The inability to address these two issues are directly tied to the need to establish this competition that is unnecessary. Hence the term race. Last point. Because we know that um, power structures like to deny African presence in places. And Andrew points out to the Negro features found in some of the people of that area and region. So I want to kind of provide you with a, a greater insight to these features. Can y'all see this? So these are the Olmec heads that were uh, built in the Central, uh, uh, Central America, Mexico region. Um, so when you talk about Negroid features, Look at those, look at the nose. So very broad, African looking nose. Very broad, African looking lips. I'm trying to get the back of her head. Um, what do these look like? What are these? Now, they look familiar as a hairstyle to no one? They look like locks. Locks of braids, right? An African hairstyle. So this is another evidence, right? On top of what Van Sertima points us to far as the cultural confluence, right? And the blood confluence, because we know that blood thing happens. But this is another archaeological evidence that supports the reality that African people were here in the United States, right? Um, just like they try to say that the African people did not build the pyramids and aliens came down and built the pyramids, um, there's uh, pseudoscience that says those rocks were made that way because a landslide happened and it rolled down the hill to produce those features. That's as asinine as aliens coming down to make the pyramid. But these are the links that Western scholars will go through to devalue African humanity, African intelligence, and African presence as the originator of, of civilization, right? Final comments, questions, or concerns? So my uh, thought on pre-Columbia is a probably a summation of the true meaning of what Africans was based on the reading that uh, a couple of weeks ago when we was talking about how they taught each other and passed down culture and intelligent and how to treat people and how to be kind. These Africans obviously had that within themselves, that kind of, uh, you know, living culture and background and ethics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they brought it there. And so the Mexican people saw this as peaceful. They didn't see this as you know, bringing violence or any kind of disturbance, but they also had a spirit that they recognized as peaceful and uh, peace recognizes peace is my point. And so uh, that makes it a lot easier for them to 
you know, come from this, what they call hot land, Africa, the, you know, hot place uh, and come near and yet bring forth this and accepting them as they are. So the word accepting them and respect for them, uh, the African have respect for themselves, that that's uh, something that was stood out to me and that was very telling that I did not know even in my younger years. I just want to put that in there. Thank you, Don. Uh, Jocelyn, why don't you close this out? Um, um, I think I wanted to add on earlier when Anthony was talking about um, when he started reading the reading, he didn't expect it to be about um, basically um, two uh, groups getting along. Um, and I think um, since we prior to this, we read a lot about like stereotypes and stuff like that. So I think it was when I started reading it and I started noticing how it was indigenous and Africans getting along. I was very lucky because I didn't, I didn't know any of this before. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Um, we again, remember we're not meeting um, via Zoom for class on Wednesday. We'll be attending the event, uh, but please read what we should be discussing for Wednesday. Uh, we'll talk about that on Monday. So we're just pushing the, the souls of black folks back to Monday, and then we'll remove uh, one of the readings for next week. We'll just remove that and we're gonna do souls of black folks. It's like vitally important that we uh, engage that text. So we'll just move that reading back to Monday. Um, hopefully I can see some of you all in person at the event. Again, um, be prepared to even ask questions, right? And, and some of the questions that you have about this reading, it'll be a great space to um, engage in questions there at the event on Wednesday. Uh, any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns for me? All right, y'all. Uh, have a great rest of your evening.